inspiring is a is is a poor word to describe this. But Cherry, really, uh, you're a light unto our, our nation and and some rays of this light with us today. So thank you for live um, draw. I'm I'm gonna as we as we discuss Sherry, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Feel free to deviate from uh, the topics too and share with anything you want. But I'll begin with the first question, if you don't mind. I'm actually gonna pin your video so that everyone can see you. Uh, but I'm gonna begin with the first question, speaking about uh, how you rose from this unfathomable tragedy of the Kobe. Uh, I know you wrote two books, as mentioned. The Road to Resilience being the most recent one. And I, I wanted to ask you if you had to pick some specific ideas from these books, maybe ideas that resonated most with people, what would they be? I think those ideas can inspire us specifically during this pandemic. So if you had to pick some ideas from, this, uh, from these two books, what would they be? Okay, well, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody. And also, I want to tell you that I worked in Arizona one summer at Sunset Crater, Sunset Crater National Park when I was 19. So does anybody know that place? <laughs> Everyone's yes, on mute, course. but I'm sure oh, you can okay. raise your hand. Anyway, yes. that's, my, that's my connection to Arizona. But, oh, what, what would I want to share? I think, you know, looking back, first of all, Kobe was killed 19 years ago. So we, we've been through a lot. I think in my book, The Road to Resilience, I mentioned seven steps of, of resilience. And they all start with the letter C. And the second step is community. So just the fact that you're all gathered here and you're in a community tells me that you have resilience. Because once you can receive from a community and then be able to give to a community, I think that makes all the difference. And after Kobe was killed, the first in Israel, you know, the, the funeral it was a few hours after they found the boys. He was, he was murdered with his friend, Yosef Ichran, and Kobe was 13, Yosef was 14. Um, after the funeral that night, when I, when I went to sleep, a friend of mine had put flowers on my pillow and a note. And it, it, was, it was, I don't want to use the word gestures because it was something, it was like a beautiful action because I felt like I just wanted to die. And when I went up to my bed, there were these beautiful flowers. There. So, and the story um, continues because just last week, her husband died, his friend. And I, I'm very close with them. And I, I gave a eulogy at the funeral. But that, <clears throat> like that evening, all of a sudden I remembered and I, I um, called her daughter. And um, I couldn't get her, but I, she gave me the number, the granddaughter. And I spoke to the granddaughter and I said, please do me a favor, put flowers on Shira's pillow and write a note saying we love you and it was just she was so moved by that but she knew exactly why I had done it and it was 19 years later but I just after that I when I um spoke to her I said it is just so true what you give in this world comes back to you mm -hmm. All right. Um, wow. That's quite amazing. Um, thank you, Sherry. Yeah, and it was just, I, I wouldn't have done that. Like, I would never have thought to do that. But because she had done it to me, it was like, so, I mean, I forgot about it. But all of a sudden, like at bedtime, I remembered, we have to do this. But it was just because there's something about receiving. When somebody gives you what you need, and you receive it, then it motivates you to give. Mm, right. And those are glimmers of light in, in such dark moments. Um, and and to, to, to continue to develop this idea, if I may, so these are gestures. You don't want to use the word gesture, but these are 
uh, great tokens, however we may want to call them, that people gave you. Are there any words, messages that uh, people gave you throughout the years, not necessarily during Shiva, but throughout the years that stood out in your mind? And I'm asking that question because it can help each and every one of us also comfort those who need comfort with uh, the words that do work. Right. Well, first of all, I want to say I also I trained as a pastoral counselor. So <clears throat> part of comforting somebody, especially in a shiva, is just being there and not speaking unless you really have something that you think you need to say that's, that's, that's focused on that person and on the person who died. But during our shiva for Kobe, we had thousands of people come and there were a few things that really helped me. One was this woman that I knew, and I knew that her um, brother was a soldier who had been killed in Israel. And she came to the Shiva and she sat down with me and she looked at me and she said, my mother, this woman, I'm speaking as if I'm this woman. She said, my mother lost her son to war she was a Holocaust survivor. She lost her family. She came to Israel after the, after the war. And then she lost my brother in war. And, she looked, and then this woman looked at me and she said, but my mother had many blessings. And you're going to have blessings. And that was, to me, what I needed to hear. Because... I really didn't think I would I'd be able to go on and I didn't know how I would be a mother <clears throat> or a wife or just be alive, just be alive. And um, that really helped. There was one woman who came to the Shiva and she had lost her son, also in a terrible terror attack, also in a wadi in a canyon while they were hiking. And it wasn't what she said to me, but I looked at her and she looked alive. Like she was, you know, she looked beautiful. She was alive. And I felt like that was the message I needed to hear. Just that you can still live. You can still be alive. Hmm. Even, even during that year, I remember once I was, that year I was in the old city. And I didn't even know this person. And I was walking in the old city and he said to me, wait. And he went and he bought me this book on prayer this huge book on prayer by Rabbi Korsky, a really, really beautiful book. And it was not, I mean, I'm not saying that I just need presence. Everything was okay. But it was this feeling, I'm not alone in this. We're not alone in this. I think that is um, something really important. Like we just had Yom HaZikaron. We just had Memorial Day last week. And Memorial Day here is also for victims of terror. And it's it's a really hard day for me usually. And in fact, I was kind of happy that we were in quarantine because it's just too difficult. And um, like we go to Kobe school and they do a ceremony and it's just, it's so painful. And instead they have a siren here for, you know, for Yom HaShoah, for Holocaust day, and also for Yom HaZikaron, for Memorial Day, they have a two minute siren but they sent kids from B'nai Akiva, from the youth group, two kids to be with us when, when that siren went off. And that for me was just great to be with somebody, but not to have to be out in the world. And then also the rabbi came and he brought us flowers. He, this is new, we have a new rabbi. And he, he comes to us every year and he brings us something, but it's, it's a conversation and it's just feeling <clears throat> we're not alone, and we're, we're not forgotten. That's, that's people's fear that the person they loved will just be forgotten. So that, that recognition and acknowledgement, I think, important. Right, right. Okay, um, Sherry, moving on to maybe a, 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 a big topic, but, you know, I've, as many of us, we've followed you over the years, uh, read your books, as mentioned, and I, I personally think that you embody this quiet and, and profound uh, faith in Hashem. 
in God. And I, I have to ask you, uh, you know, many ask, where is God? And why did God do this to me? How did faith play out in your life in general, and particularly during these, these great moments of challenge? And I'm asking you also so that we can maybe derive some inspiration from you during these times, this uh, pandemic that has challenged and disrupted many of us. Okay, well, first of all, I want to say I, did, I didn't grow up religious. I didn't grow, I had no Hebrew school, no Hebrew, no connection to Israel, and really no knowledge of the Jewish religion. So it wasn't until I came to Israel um, that I started learning. And then I ended up <clears throat> living in Israel so, and becoming religious. But I wouldn't say that I had faith. I liked, I liked the system thought like, whoa, this is really cool. And I loved learning. I loved Torah. Um, so faith, I, I just say everything changed for me after Kobe was killed because I, I, needed, I needed to believe in something. And like regular life just wasn't enough. I think for me before Kobe was murdered, like I was just happy. I, I was just happy with regular life. That was that was sufficient. But once Kobe was killed, it was like he he was in the other world. He was my oldest son, and I had to find a way to connect to him. So, a neighbor of mine, she came to me. That's the thing. We we weren't friends, but she came to me, and we started learning to healing. We started learning sounds, and as we learned, I felt like. All of a sudden, this was my language because I needed a language that was more pure and more holy. So I connected to the language. And then in terms of God, I felt like God sent me messages. And my children, like they tell me, don't tell people that. You know, <laughs> don't think you're crazy. And I was not that kind of person at all, but I, I feel like that first year after Kobe was killed, that God sent me messages and there were a lot of them having to do with birds. Like if you read my book, The Blessing of a Broken Heart, there are so many stories with birds there. And you know, I, I, I've spoken a lot and all over the world and every time I speak and tell the bird stories, people come up to me and say that they had um, incidents with birds also, but he, they love died. So faith for me also, I don't think faith is just something you have. It like faith for me, it comes and goes and, but it's still something like that I strive for. And let's say like, I am not the best person with prayer, but I like to talk to God. Like, I, I feel like I need something bigger. I need something that's really meaningful. And as far as God allowing suffering in the world, I feel like we, we just don't know, we don't understand. And in a way that means that God's world is bigger than our imagination or our intellect. And to me in a way that's comforting because we're all gonna die and we're really, like we're really souls in, in bodies. So somehow I needed that soul connection and, and I feel like that's what, that's what this kind of, I'd say quest for faith or striving for connection um, is about, but I also feel that in Israel, God is maybe more apparent. Like, I, I don't know if he's in Arizona, although, I mean, I'm sure he's in Arizona. But, you know, it's funny. I mean, I don't know funny, but in my book, I talk about I, after, that first year after Kobe was killed, I, I went to Florida to visit my mother. And I was walking on the beach and I, and I said to myself, I wonder if like Kobe's soul came from Israel to Florida with me. Would he be in, would that soul want to be in Boca? Oh, and um, I sat down, I was, I was walking when I was thinking this, and then I sat down 
and I had a sandwich and I took a bite from my sandwich and a bird came and hit me in the head. And I, <laughs> I told my sister this and she's, she was like, that, that was your answer. So, and she's totally not religious. It was, um, you know, sometimes it's like you, you need, you need and you find. Right. Right, that's beautiful. And there are many beautiful birds in Arizona too. <laughs> so I'm sure God is here also, uh, not just in Boca, but, but certainly Israel is his home. I can't tell you, Sherry, on a personal note, how many weddings I've officiated at, at, at and, and birds all of a sudden landed on the chuppah canopy. To me, it's a sign that the souls are there of, of the relatives. Wow. Of right. So yeah, and yeah. that resonated with me in your book. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe speaking a little bit about your foundation, still in the same context, of course, but you attend, you've attended to so many people who have suffered in all sorts of different ways, um, mainly from terror attacks in Israel over the years. Um, if, if, if there was one common message, or maybe a few common messages that you give to people suffering, what, what would they be? I mean, we all suffer in some shape or form. Some suffer greatly and some not so greatly. But when we deal with that suffering, our emotions get the best of us. And, and how can we handle them? Okay, well, first of all, um, for adults, it's a little bit different, but I don't think you have to handle it. I, like, I think it's okay to fall apart. I mean, not totally and not forever, but this, like this woman, Shira, who was my friend, but she's also a grief counselor. Um, that first year with my children, they were very young and I would start crying. And she said to me, time yourself, tell them, give me a minute. And so I would say to the kids, I'd give them my watch when I was crying and I'd say, just give Ima a minute, just give mommy a minute to cry and time me. They would look at the, they would time me on the watch and they saw that you could have sorrow, like their mother could be, have a lot of sorrow, but it was limited. It wasn't gonna break her, wasn't gonna break the family. And it became a kind of game that we played. Mm -hmm. So, and after a while, they didn't even know, they didn't bother them because they knew it was part of, of pain, but it, it didn't mean that pain was going to overwhelm us. And, Actually, in my book on resilience, um, I talk about, there's this thing called the family story. And it's in my chapter on commemoration. And these, <clears throat> uh, this research found that children who knew their family story were more resilient than other children. But it was because they knew the ups and downs of their family. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a kind of, can be a kind of comfort for everybody where there's a truth that life is made of sorrow and happiness and they're not opposites. Like, sorrow contains happiness and happiness contains sorrow. Like even during the Shiva, when we were really at our worst, we had, we were laughing some, at some things that like people, who should have known better said, where we were like, afterwards we were just laughing, even though in our pain, we, we had this kind of, I wouldn't call it happiness, but some kind of relief. And in happiness too, like you can acknowledge that there's pain there. Because, you know, my, when my um, daughter got married, there was, her, her brother was missing. But it didn't, it didn't ruin anything. It didn't, didn't even bring me down, really. It was more like, oh, gamze, like also. So I think just recognizing that they're not mutually exclusive happiness. They, they're really friends. Mm. Very profound. Very profound. That's why we break a glass at weddings. Right. right. That's why Tisha B'Av is also called the festival. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, if I may, just two more questions. I know that uh, we're almost running out of time, but a macro question and a micro question. So the macro question is, uh, you, you faced the most maybe 
brutal form of anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, we live in a time where um, anti-Semitism is, is rearing its ugly head once again. Um, what would you say is the best way to combat Jew hatred or anti-Semitism in general? Oh, um, well, first, first of all, <clears throat> I think to just really be more Jewish. I don't know if it will combat anti-Semitism. I think it's more <laughs> another question. Yes. Thinking please. of that, it's like what to do in when I used to speak and I more in the beginning and people would say like what do you want people to do as a result of your speaking and I would always say I want them to be more Jewish because Kobe was killed for being a Jew he was he was murdered for being Jewish so I felt like not that there's a solution but that I really felt like Kobe loved being, he loved Judaism and he loved Israel. He was so thrilled to live in Israel. So to really, I felt like everyone should just connect to Israel and connect to Judaism and to Torah and to learning and to just bringing that part, the Jewish part of their life to make that the biggest part of their life. Mm, but I don't know about anti-Semitism, how to fight no, that. Right. You gave a beautiful answer. That, that's really beautiful, and and we should lead to that to that call to that answer. Now the the micro question, and that is that many of us are parents, educators, uh, we're quarantined now, most of us, and if uh, we have to deal with our relationships, regardless of what we desire sometimes or not. But if if again there is a message or multiple messages that you can give to parents and educators, especially uh, today, a relevant message, would it be? I mean, you're a mother, you're, a, you're the mother of Kobe and the mother of children too. Is there and then, an education? And a grandmother, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I would just say chill, <laughs> chill. chill. <laughs> <laughs> like just don't, I used to get, I was really uptight when, as, when I was, first being a mommy and after my after Kobe was killed it was like I realized that the only thing that mattered to me was my family and my children like I used before Kobe was killed I don't like to talk about this really but I would get into power struggles with them and I and after Kobe was killed that just it all left you know I just didn't have that power struggle and I feel, in fact, with my kids, I don't think they had, you know, they weren't really normal teenagers because it was too hard for them to rebel against us, I think. But my youngest, when he started rebelling, like my husband and I, we were happy. <laughs> and to him, wow, we're so happy you're rebelling. Like, that's such a good sign to us that you're, you're like a normal kid. But also I said to him, you know, you can push me as far away as you want, but I'm always going to be here for you. Beautiful. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much. Any concluding words that you'd like to share with anyone? I mean, you've given us so much already, but um, I, maybe we'll take a question or two if you have the time, Sherry, via chat. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, that's fine. So mm -hmm. uh, can you... There's a question, which is, I like these type of questions because it's a call to action, more than just a question in the air. But can you, uh, there we go. Rabbi, can you please ask Sherry to provide the address for Kobe's foundation? Today is Giving Tuesday, and some may want oh, to donate. Great. So, so do you have the address offhand? And I'll, well, I'll share it with everyone here. You, have to, you can go on the website. It's kobemandel.org, K-O-B-Y. Okay. I'll write it on the um, chat. Should I yeah. write it on the chat? Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's so kind. Beautiful. Great question. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, oh, thank you. KobeMandel.org. Thank you. Okay. Um, just one question here, and maybe we'll end with this one. How did you first connect with Avi Lieberman as the com comedy for Kobe show? <laughs> yeah, that's a miracle. We have a lot of miracle stories. He connected with us. 
he was maybe, maybe he give us a, a one sentence about what Kobe uh, comedy for Kobe is. Yeah, we we do comedy for Kobe. It's a fundraiser where we bring four comedians from America um, twice a year as fundraisers. In fact, we were supposed to have one in May, I think, this month, but we can't do it, of course. Um, but <clears throat> he he was Avi is a comedian from California, and he was doing this for another organization and it didn't work out. And he was actually looking for an organization and his, um, a fundraiser that we know met us, met my husband and he told him about um, Avi and my husband said, fine. And because the other organizations, they were worried about the, the comedians, but we were, we were thrilled. So we've been doing it for 10 years and it's great because it's, for all the Anglos in Israel. And we right. get amazing comedians to come and make us laugh. And Kobe was really funny too, so he would love it. Okay, beautiful. Well, Sherry, we can't thank you enough, really, for giving us of your time and of your wisdom and inspiration. Uh, today, I, I want to encourage everyone, yes, to go to kobemandel.org. Today's Giving Tuesdays was mentioned. To also purchase uh, um, Sherry's books, if you haven't read them yet, they will truly, uh, uh, you know, inspire you and empower you, and of course, inspire every, uh, encourage everyone also to follow the words of Sherry today, to be more Jewish, as you said, as uh, is the best answer to any type of anti-Semitism and best answer in general to life, <laughs> to always take a step forward in our Jewishness, in our own spiritual journey. And uh, we, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Sherry, for doing just that today, pushing us okay. forward and upward and strengthening our relationship with God and with our community, with uh, you, the Jewish people everywhere, and most importantly, with our deeper self. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.